635. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Tim Johnson. I'm a deputy DA with the Boulder County District Attorney's Office. I'm also the director of the uh, Community Protection Program. Um, and with our program, we're out in the community really talking about safety, talking about ways to guard yourself against scams. Uh, we talk to all groups. Um, before we start today, it gives me a tremendous amount of pleasure to introduce, um, as of tomorrow, who will be the new DA in Boulder County, and that's a Michael Doherty, and he's joined us here tonight, and I wanted to give him an opportunity to say hi to you and give you just a minute. Well, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me, or should I use the mic? It doesn't matter. Use the mic. I can hear you. Use the mic. Use the mic. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, it's not funny. I'm hard of hearing. Okay. No, I'm happy to use the mic. So as Tim said, tomorrow morning, I'll have the greatest moment and greatest honor of my career. I'll be sworn in as the next district attorney at Boulder County. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I didn't want to miss it. And I had the privilege of sitting down with Tim today and talking about the important work this office has done. And it's become a model statewide in terms of our efforts to protect the community. You know, when I started as a prosecutor 20 years ago, I was at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in New York City. I specialized in sex crimes, human trafficking, and homicide cases, and crime was at an all-time high. And so much of what we did was react. Crimes would be committed, and we reacted. And we tried to bring our best resources in response. But we could do better than that. And this office, with Tim's help and Liz's help, has done better by getting out in the community and helping you avoid becoming victims. And instead of being reactive, trying to talk about prevention and trying to talk about how we could protect ourselves and protect our family members from identity theft consumer fraud and these scams that plague all of us. My commitment to identity theft is perhaps best demonstrated by the fact that I married the head of the identity theft unit for the Manhattan DA's office, who's now the mother of our 10-year-old twins. Smart man. Thank you. It, and that's not her only strength, but yes, thank you. Uh, but if she were standing here right now, she would say that this is the most important area that we deal in, and she shares the passion that Tim and Liz bring to it. And I certainly do as well. And I've been prosecuting fraud cases and identity theft and consumer protection cases for the past 20 years. I was at the Manhattan DA's office. My last three years there, I was actually in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the entire office of 1,300 people. But I moved out to Colorado. My wife and I made the decision to move out here to start up a wrongful conviction project to see if anybody was sitting in a Colorado State prison who was, in fact, innocent. We came up here to start up, start up that project. It was an incredible honor to be a part of that effort and to help exonerate people such as Robert Dewey, who had served 18 years in state prison for a murder he truly did not commit. And the DNA testing helped us identify and successfully prosecute the actual killer, a man named Douglas Thames. And from there, I was put in charge of the criminal justice section for the Attorney General's office. And they have a statewide consumer protection unit and focus. But we also have a responsibility at local district attorney's offices to get out and talk to the community and do everything we can to help protect our community members. In the last five years, I've been the second in command for the district attorney's office in Jefferson and Gilpin counties. And tomorrow, it'll be my great honor to become your district attorney. And this is such an important area for our office, and I'm going to maintain Stan Garnett's strong commitment to this with Tim's help and Liz's help. And I'll start by telling you a moment that I had today. I'm sitting in the conference room next to Stan's office. We're working on a bunch of things, and I get a cell phone call. I, I think it's 303. I said, oh, who, who could this be? It's an exciting time in my life right now. There's a lot going on. And I answer, and I find out that I've been pre-approved for a loan that I did not apply for. And I'm on the do not call list. How many of you are on the do not call list? Doesn't work. Doesn't work, right? Doesn't work. We need to put real teeth back in that law. But in the meantime, what we need to do is have people from my office come out and talk to you about how to avoid being scammed. Because we have too many people in our community, particularly seniors, who are being ripped off by these scam artists. Another good example would be the IRS scams that I'm sure Tim will be talking about, where the IRS will call and say, we're putting a lien on your house unless you give a payment right now. And a lot of people fall for that. You won't, because you're here. But the people that do give up their life savings, give up their hard-fought earnings, and it's a scam. The IRS will never call you. Those are the scams that Tim and Liz have dedicated their time to becoming experts in, making sure you never become victims of. So as your district attorney, or as your next district attorney as of tomorrow morning, it's my great privilege to have Tim and Liz give this presentation to you tonight. Before I do that, if you have any questions about my background or my priorities, I'm happy to take those now before we jump into the scam presentation. All right, well, it's great meeting you all. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to talking to you further. And without further ado, Tim. 
Thanks, Michael. All right. Um, so the way things are going to kind of work tonight, I'm going to talk about a lot of the scams out there, a lot of the scams you've probably heard of and seen. I have a couple video clips, and I'll start with one uh, that Lester Holt did last year talking about IRS scams. But I'm going to talk to you about a little bit of some of the ones that we see people kind of falling to more and more. Uh, things such as what we call the Microsoft scan, uh, where you get a call from Microsoft because there's a virus on your system that you didn't know about. We also have sweetheart scams, where you meet someone online, uh, and they're working uh, relief efforts in the Sudan. And they just need a couple hundred bucks uh, to help put up a hospital. And sure enough, someone gives them a couple hundred bucks. And of course, my favorite uh, you'll hear about, I need to pull this off my message machine at home. Um, I work very closely with the Boulder County Sheriff's Office. They patrol in this area. And uh, I got a phone call from them one day um, saying I would missed jury duty. And that was a surprise to me because I didn't know I had jury duty. <laughs> and that I had a warrant for my arrest. And that was a surprise to me, too, because I know we don't issue warrants if you miss jury duty. Uh, and ways of paying that. Um, and so, of course, I called back. And I really wanted to engage them and talk with them. And ended up talking to them for more than a half hour while I was cooking dinner for my kids. And at the end, going, no, it's not interested. You can come arrest me. And of course, then he hangs up. But during that half hour, I'm hoping I took away a little bit of time that he might have spent scamming other people. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, I always put this up here, the copyright notice. I'm going to jump out of this uh, <coughs> presentation real quick, show this video, and then we'll start talking about some of the scams. warning from the IRS and the FBI about a scam that thousands have fallen for. Phone calls demanding money for taxes you don't owe. It's so widespread, the IRS placed it on a list of so-called dirty dozen tax frauds for this year. NBC's Olivia Stearns met with one woman who can't escape these threatening phone calls. So he's saying final notice and we have filed a lawsuit. Yes, it's scary. That's the third call Gretchen Lindquist has gotten in just three weeks from someone pretending to be with the IRS and demanding money. It's very upsetting. And then this morning, again, one more time from a different phone number. I'm starting to feel threatened by the repeat calls. Luckily, Gretchen, an IT analyst in Houston, is savvy enough to know these calls are bogus. 900,000 people have reported getting one of these calls, and the IRS estimates 5,000 have paid up. The concern is that we're just scratching the surface, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And even anecdotally, knowing the people in this office have gotten calls like this, my father has gotten calls like this. U.S. Attorney Preet Bahara works to track down the people on the other end of the line. Last year, he sent the ringleader of a massive IRS call center fraud to jail for 14 years. How hard is it to catch these guys? It's sometimes very difficult because you have people who are not necessarily in the United States. You have shell companies that are being used. The IRS wants you to know it will never contact you for the first time by phone, demand credit card information, or threaten arrest. Gretchen and I decided to call one of the numbers back. You just called my friend and threatened her with a lawsuit, claiming to be a federal agency. For Gretchen, though, it's no joke. I don't even want to answer the phone. I really, I'm about to get my cellular phone number changed. Now, if you do get a call like this, the U.S. attorney is asking that you please hang up the phone and report it to the FBI. You can do so right on their website or by phone. But Lester, remember, no matter what, the most important thing here is please do not give your social security number out over the phone. How about that reaction? It's a prank. It's a prank. Unbelievable. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here. And click on any of the videos the over here to watch the latest interviews, um, show highlights, really and common. digital and exclusives. Fact, phone scams right Thanks now are for so watching. Common that I get them at work. Um, I was uh, telling folks while we we're getting ready, um, all the county numbers start with a 441 extension. And I know just from working with the county as long as I have that when the number then starts with a 4 after that, that it's the Boulder Police Department that's calling. And I'll get numbers, you know, calls periodically from them. So I just pick up the phone. Well, recently, within the last six months, at least once a week, I am told that I have won a cruise um, and just to stay on the line. And it's a pre-recorded call, not an actual person. But when they call in, they're spoofing that number to make it look like it's coming from inside the county number. Um, and I don't know a way to get around it. I don't know how they have my number. 
I just know that when I get it and I start hearing the, hey, you've won a prize, just hang up. Now I'll get another call within about five minutes from the exact same number saying the exact same thing. And I'm not sure, again, why I'm getting that, um, but just kind of know that those are out there. Um, so when we start talking about some of the scams, IRS calls, those are going to be the ones that we're seeing now. It's almost March. Um, <laughs> your tax day is only six weeks away. And uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of those. And the numbers that you saw, that there were over 900,000 of these calls, and yet 5,000 people were victimized. And again, if they were only victimized, $500. Well, again, that's a quarter million dollars that's out there that someone is lost uh, it, or someone has gained unlawfully. So it's really dangerous when you're saying, oh, it's only a couple hundred bucks. And a lot of times we're talking with people who are saying, well, yeah, I got scammed, but it was only $100. Well, again, when they're doing this three, four, five times a day, that's where it's really dangerous because they're making four, five, six thousand dollars, and those folks that are out the hundred bucks might not step up and report. And we want you to report. If you have friends that are saying this happened to me, encourage them to report. And at the very end of this presentation, I have our contact information in the back. Um, we have information, uh, 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 handout information that has our phone numbers. And Liz Parker, um, who is part of our, our unit, is back there as well. She's uh, one of the, the many folks that will actually answer the phone when you call and can talk about issues. And please call. Um, today we were uh, talking in the office uh, that we've seen a decline in our phone calls recently. Um, we want to make sure that we're hearing about the scams that are going on. Once the spring storms run through, we're going to get what we call gypsy roofers coming through, saying, it looks like your roof is damaged. Uh, for 100 bucks, we can look at it and we can start repairs right away. And someone might say, 100 bucks? That's not bad. And of course, they give the people $100 and they never show back up. And a lot of times, people don't report that. Well, again, it's important that you do because the $100 that you're out might lead them to be emboldened to ask for $1,000 or $3,000, which uh, unfortunately we've seen come through our office. Uh, Miss Jury Duty, I talked about. The tech support is the big one right now. And tech support is really a scary thing because you're gonna get a phone call on the phone and we all know that when you have a computer or a tablet, that once it's out of the box and once you start loading programs on it, it slows down. And there are times in which it doesn't connect to the internet properly and these things are typically pretty frustrating. And you're gonna get this call that says, we're from Microsoft Tech Support and we know that you have a problem with your computer, we can fix it. And so they'll talk about fixing it and all you'll need to do is go onto your computer and go to a particular website and click on a particular link and then put in your personal information and they'll take control of your computer. They absolutely do. They take control of your computer and typically lock you out and they will take all the sensitive information off of it and they might say in order to unlock this you're going to have to pay us $200. That's something that we hear uh, referred to as ransomware these days. Those are really dangerous calls because they sound very legitimate and again because folks have computer problems all the time it's like, wow, how did they know? They didn't, it's a scammer that's actually calling you. Um, a relative in trouble and danger, we see these quite a bit. This is when someone calls on the phone, you pick up the phone and say hello, and they say, do you know who this is? And they go, Sally? It is Sally. And again, they're fishing for information and they're listening really close to your cues. And I was like, well, Sally, we haven't talked in a while. It's like, I know I'm in Oregon right now and our car broke down and I need some money in order to spend the night in a motel. And we unfortunately talk to people probably every month who either have received this scam call or have fallen prey to this scam call. And what they end up doing is, and it's typically some kind of emergency, is they're instructed, well, go to the Best Buy or go to you know some store and buy gift cards. And then once you've purchased the gift cards, give us the codes. And once those codes are revealed, the money is taken out of those gift cards and you've been victimized. It seems like, gosh, who would fall for this? But again, we're seeing these pretty often. And we're seeing these, it's often um, our elder population that is being victimized by this, but those folks that are calling saying, I've been victimized, are getting younger and younger now. Um, handyman scams are similar to the roofer scams where people come by and say, hey, you know, I know that you have work that you need to do, or you're looking for a handyman and you go onto Craigslist or Backpage or some other kind of service saying, I'm looking for someone to, you know, fix some things around the house. And you hire them and they come and they say, hmm, okay, I can do this. I just need to get $150 for supplies. I'll be back later this afternoon. Sounds reasonable. They've got a, a Craigslist ad. 
So you give them $150 and they disappear. And again, sometimes you're thinking, gosh, that was a really tough lesson for me to learn. I'm not going to do that again. But as long as they continue to operate on Craigslist, they're going to continue to victimize those out there. And we really do want you to talk about them. Um, fishing. And that's not the kind of fishing that we all actually do enjoy doing. Uh, this is trying to get information from you. And I will tell you that the fishing is getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, and I'll talk about that, and I'll talk about how a very clever uh, fisherman actually was able to convince the head of cybersecurity for the White House in providing uh, personal information. Um, oh, that's great stuff. Lottery scams, again, we see these every year uh, where you get a phone call saying you've won a lottery. And all you need to do is send $198 to cover any kind of shipping fees as well as taxes, and you'll get your $5,000 reward. And people do it. And it is frustrating because, you know, again, you want to be that winner. You want to say, my goodness, wouldn't it be great to come into, you know, $1,000 or $5,000 or even more? And that idea of I've won something is so overriding that folks will sometimes get had by it. Um, charity scams, unfortunately, these are still around. Um, how many of you here have gotten a phone call from PBS or some other uh, charity and said, I will give? I mean, that's what we want to do. We want to be able to give. And I, we're routine. Uh, my family, I've got four children between the ages of 7 and 14. We give to PBS a lot. And when PBS calls, I really want to say, yes, we'll give to you over the phone. But I know that it might not actually be PBS that's called. And so I will get their name. I will log on to the PBS website. And I'll actually go there and make the donation there and put in the note that I talked to Carl on the phone. So Carl, if it really was Carl, gets credit for it. And a lot of times, you know, the callers are fine with that. But a lot of times they're kind of, you know, provide that pressure. Oh, no, 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 I need to be able to say that I made these particular calls. Won't you consider at least doing $20? Again, they're looking for just that little bit or for you to give them their credit card information so they can exploit you further. And then finally, just straight identi identity theft. Identity theft ha happens, unfortunately, way too much. Um, there was a... Uh, gas station um, that's located on the like a south side of Superior that was um, victimized by a credit card scanner. Um, so some bad guys came in, put a credit card scanner on the uh, machines. Yeah, it's, it, it, that one got hit too, but it's the, it, it, I'm not sure who, the, it's the one that's in the Safeway parking lot further east. Yeah, I don't know who runs that, if it's a Safeway one or not. But they had a credit card reader on there, and there were probably 80 victims that would come in and put their credit card information in. And what it does is it doesn't affect the sale. It just scans the card before it actually goes into the legitimate machine, and it gets your information. And those cards, which don't have the scramble um, smart chip in there, they're able to exploit. And they're harder to do now, but it's still something that can happen. When that happens, you become the victim of identity theft. And it can just be a huge inconvenience, but it can also be a liability to you. And so I'll talk to you about some of the tools and tips that you have to avoid that. So again, spotting the scam. Most of the scam artists that either come to your door, call you on the phone, contact you via email or text, they're there because there's some kind of urgency. It's Sally calling from Oregon. Your computer's on the fritz. Um, you have a warrant for your arrest because you failed to pay taxes and show up for jury duty. Whatever it is, you're in trouble somehow and you need to take care of it right now. And if you don't, there's going to be a serious consequence. They're looking for you to be in a position where you don't have time to think about things. And then the idea is that it's possibly true. Sometimes the information, because again, when I got a call from the Boulder County Sheriff's Office saying I missed jury duty, well, it wasn't like it was something from the Teller County Sheriff's Office down near Colorado Springs calling me. And that's like, I know that's fake because I don't live down there. It wasn't that it was someone calling that didn't sound authentic. They identified themselves as an officer, and it sounded plausible. I know it wasn't. But there are going to be folks out there that don't have that life experience and might get had by it. But that's how you spot the scam. There's always going to be some sense of urgency. It's when the person comes by selling windows and says, the offer's available right now. If you buy from us right now and all we need is a credit card to secure your deposit, we'll you know, lock in that 35% discount for the first five windows and we'll keep that price for the next two years. We just need to have that initial 
credit card payment, that initial $100 deposit. And it's because of that sense of urgency that you want to act right now. Any legitimate business, any legitimate charity is going to want to take your money legitimately. And if you tell them, I, you know, this sounds like a great deal. I want to do some investigation and I want to be able to call you guys back and actually talk to you more about it. Is that okay? And if they're like, sure, and they give you a card, take it. But don't call the number on that card. Go to the website that the company actually belongs to. So search it. Don't rely on the, the, the website that's provided. But, you know, if it's a, a window company, you know, type in what you think it is. Go to that website and actually look it up and say, hey, someone came by. They were asking about these windows. Sometimes, and we have had circumstances where those door-to-door -door window salespeople who always seem to come through in the springtime, the legitimate ones, seem to be missing brochures. You know, they'll leave the brochures at people's homes. Well, again, if I'm a smart scam artist and I know they're in a neighborhood, I'm just going to follow behind them and I'm going to pick a whole bunch of them up. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to be the window salesperson from whichever company it is. And I might earn a few hundred bucks the easy way. So the idea is if you have to act immediately, put the brakes on. It could be a sales pitch, but it could be a scam. We want to make sure that you folks are safe with that. So again, this is the 2016 numbers. They haven't released 2017 numbers. You can get an idea as to the consumer complaints which are out there. Debt collection, imposter scams, identity theft, those are the top ones. Um, it keeps going down, bank and lenders, auto-related complaints and the like. But the top complaints that we're seeing are the ones that we're seeing that wash over into the criminal area. Debt collection. So again, if you have someone calling saying, you know, we were you know, looking at your records. It looks like you had a loan from about 15 years ago for about $10,000. We're willing to settle for $100 or $1,500 or whatever else it is. Those are some of the scams that we are seeing. They're not legitimate. But again, is it plausible? Gosh, did I take out a loan? I don't think so, but I think I'm all paid up, but I'm worried because they said they're going to file a lawsuit against me. Is it worth just paying the $100 to have them go away? No, it's a scam. And so be very cautious of a lot of those. Uh, the imposter scams, again, are the ones that I've been talking about. Um, skip this just so we can talk a little bit more. To give you an idea on the losses, um, so this is um, from the, uh, the federal government talks about how much money uh, fraud is costing folks. You'll see in 2015 and 2016, we're talking about three quarters of a billion dollars in losses. I mean, this is not a small amount. And you'll see that the averages are fairly low. It's about $1,100 per victim. But the reason they're low is it discourages people from going to the police. A lot of people say, that was just a really hard lesson. I'm not going to do that again. And it leaves these folks free to continue. And what's really frustrating for us is, again, if we get a phone call about a scam that's happened and someone says, well, it was only $1,100, well, that's a lot of money. And we want to make sure that we are putting proper resources from law enforcement and our division in our in our community protection division to actually do something. Yeah. Oh. oh. All right. <laughs> Sweet. That's pretty cool. I like that. Let me. Um, I'm gonna turn I that off. Go ahead. Question. What is that? What you said the big break gas station is doing this. Is that why they changed their um? Uh -huh. what, I'm just curious. When did that happen? When? I can't remember. <laughs> Isn't that terrible to say? We, we get them periodically throughout the county. And I just know whenever I, I come to a particular town, I look to say, hey, did we have one here? And we did. I just can't remember exactly when it was. But I want to say it was excess of a year ago. Um, and again, when you go to the gas stations, oftentimes you know that there's some kind of tampering because in order to attach the device solidly, they actually have to open up the panel. And so you'll see there's often a piece of red tape um, that is to seal that particular um, the, the security box. If that's broken or looks like it's been loosened, that's a good idea that you know this is a particular machine you should not be using and find another gas station to use. Uh, yeah. Are those statistics, does that include uh, identity theft? No, this is fully just fraudulent behavior that is done um, over the internet, phishing scams and the like. Um, identity theft is a totally different number, and it's well into the billions of dollars that are lost. Um, and unfortunately, it's difficult sometimes to show the difference. This particular agency that collects this information, uh, which is the Federal Trade Commission, 
they collect only on these kinds of frauds. And it's the lottery frauds, and it's, I mean, it's the, uh, the romance frauds, those kinds of things that they're, they're looking at. Um, but for you guys, what's really important, and people always ask, is it okay if I use my debit card to get stuff? And I will tell you that debit cards were a fantastic things back, I mean, they were introduced back in the old savings and loans days of the 1980s. Um, and of course, you saw what happened, all the savings and loans, they're all gone now. Um, but this idea of a debit card has stuck past. And sometimes the idea of, hey, I have to enter a PIN in order to use my debit card, that makes me feel safe. But again, the problem that you run into is these machines can be tampered with. Um, one of the frauds that's out there, and one of the biggest losers of a fraud, if anyone shopped at Lucky's Market and Sunflower Markets, um, when you go to the market and you scan your credit card to buy something, that particular grocery store, you know, they scan it, they do the point of sale. But they're actually not responsible for what happens with that scanned information. They hire another company and that other company says, okay, so supermarket, when that information is scanned, we'll take that information and we'll send it to the bank and we'll authorize the sale, and then we'll send it back to you saying it's been an authorized sale. And that's how you're gonna get your money. I mean, it's basically a, a, it's a exchange type of program that does this. That particular company that did for Lucky's and Sunflower Markets got hacked. And there were about 50 million credit card accounts that got victimized by that. And again, it wasn't anything that Lucky's Market or Sunflower Market did, it was the fact that this company had an open server that did not have any kind of encryption or any kind of passcodes to get into it, anyone could have gotten into it. And now we have 50 million victims that are out there because of someone's error. With a debit card, that's really serious because again, when you're entering that information, it captures that PIN. So on a debit card, between zero and two days, so again, you have to be on top of things, you can limit your losses up to $50. If you wait up to two months, it's up to $500. And again, your bank could say, sorry, it's 250 bucks. And you're like, but I'm only out 100. It's like, I know, but you know, and we're, you know, you're responsible for up to $250 because you've signed this agreement with the bank. After 61 days, you get no reimbursement at all. That's it. And so it's really concerning that that's what's gonna end up happening. With credit cards, again, up to 60 days out, they're gonna basically forgive just about anything and they'll reimburse. And depending on the credit card company that you go with, a lot of them will say, we protect 100% against fraudulent purpose, uh, purchases. So it's really smart to actually look at the credit card. And I know a lot of people get credit cards because of the travel stuff or you know, I get points and so I get you know, this check at the end of the month that's kind of nice. Don't look at that, look at what services they're gonna to provide to protect your identity and protect your safety because it's not a question of is my credit card information going to get stolen out there? It's a question of when it's going to get stolen out there. Um, do not call registry. I put up here just so if you don't have it, get on it. And you might say, it doesn't work. And I'm frustrated because it oftentimes doesn't work. But what I do know is legitimate companies, it's pretty good. Because I can make a complaint to the FCC and the FTC, and I'll say, hey, listen, I keep getting calls from Sears, and I told them not to call me. And I know darn well that those calls from Sears are gonna stop. Now the fraudulent ones, they're gonna continue. And it doesn't count if it is a charity, and it doesn't count if it's something political. Um, so again, I am, uh, we donate at ARC over in Louisville all the time. I get phone calls from them every freaking day. And it's a pain, and I know it's like they're a good company. It's like, really, I've got four kids, but they're not outgrowing their clothes that fast. Give me about a month, and I'll get you some more clothes. Um, so just be really cautious with that, but again, sign up for it because it does still work for larger companies. The scam stuff is the, the thing that's really frustrating. Internet safety. And kind of talking about this, the big question that everyone asks is, is it safe to be on the internet? I basically liken being on the internet to swimming in the ocean. It's a heck of a lot of fun. It's, a, you know, the, the, the things that you see out there are amazing, but you never know if there's gonna be a predator lurking nearby. <coughs> And again, when you jump in, you never know what's underneath you. That being said, these simple rules will really help protect you. First one, I stop before I download. Okay, so my parents went on a, um, a trip that was like this once in a lifetime trip to Iceland. And my parents are very frugal. And when they went out there, I knew darn well that they were gonna be totally out of communication 
because they were not going to pay for an international phone plan, and they sure weren't going to pay for any internet, so I'm not going to hear from them for like two weeks. And about four days in, I get an email, and the email says, we just saw this, take a look, and there's a link. And the link is something called a tiny URL, which is a way to shorten up a link. And of course, there's no way for me to see exactly what it is. And I'm like, oh, my parents, you know, they fell to some scam and something's been hacked. And if I, as soon as I click on this, it's going to release some kind of malware into my system and it's going to be bad. Because that's me as a law enforcement officer thinking, you know, bad about everything. So I sit on it and wait 10 more days for my parents to come back. And they're like, did you see the picture of the volcano? I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, we were so excited about this. We got the internet service on the cruise ship and we're able to, I had no idea that that was actually a legitimate thing. <laughs> because again, stop before I download. Is this something that I actually want and know about? If someone sends me a file and I don't know about it and I'm not expecting it, I don't download it. And in this day and age, we forget about things. Like again, if I got this email from my parents and I knew that they were in the state, I would have called them saying, hey guys, I just got this weird email from you. Did you mean to send me something? Like, oh yeah, this is great pictures that we got. Great, I can click on it and take a look. We have forgotten that simple kind of idea of talking to people. You know, it's all done electronically now. Um, pick up the phone and call them and see kind of what's going on. I think before I click, again, if I'm on a page and there's some kind of ad or banner that pops up that says, I'm the one millionth you know, visitor here, I've won an iPad, I know that's fake. My 14-year-old son, I've talked to him enough now that he actually comes to me going, Dad, I think I want an iPad, look. <laughs> no, you haven't, but at least he's talking about it now. Um, so again, think about anything before you click. If you're on a, the website for Amazon, and in the description of an item that you're interested in, it leads you off the Amazon site, know that you're swimming in the ocean at that point. You gotta think before you click. It could take you to a totally legitimate site, or it could take you to a really bad site. Um, I watched actually the news this morning, and they were talking about counterfeit makeup that is being sold on Amazon. And it's really difficult to tell the difference between the two, but the website that is embedded in the Amazon website, when you go there, it's full of malware, and it'll try to download stuff onto your computer. I don't think Amazon knew about it, because they are a pretty reputable company, but even they can be kind of had by this. And then the last one, when you're talking about passwords, mix letters and numbers. Um, I will tell you that my background, I've, I've been a prosecutor for 20 years, um, but in my other life, I'm a huge sci-fi geek. Love all the sci-fi stuff. Um, and I will tell you that I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And I will tell you that my password has something to do with Star Wars. And I don't fear telling this for embarrassment reasons or otherwise, but I will tell you is that I mix in a number of symbols, capital letters and lowercase letters. Well, you'll never guess what it is. Because think about it, I could just say Star Wars. And someone could guess that and get you know, into my password, into my accounts, and I would lose everything. But that first A, instead of making a letter A, if I made it a capital A, or better yet, I do the at symbol, that shift number two, no one's going to guess that. And again, if I start off with Star Wars with the number five or a dollar sign, no one's going to guess that either. And it's really hard to hack that kind of information. So you can have a very easy password. But when you mix it up with the numbers and letters and capitals and lowercase that don't make sense, you're going to protect yourself a ton. Um, funny story with the uh, passwords. Um, there are people on the internet, we call them black hat hackers and white hat hackers. Black hat hackers get into people's accounts to do malicious things. White hat hackers are often employed by companies to see if their systems are safe. And there's a dating company called Christian Mingle. Um, you'll see ads for them. And they basically hired a white hat hacker saying, we want to see if our accounts are safe. Guy's like, not a problem. And so he goes home and he hacks into their system because it did not have good security. He accessed uh, about 60,000 account emails. And he emailed them faking information saying that he was from Christian Mingle and said, your account is about to expire. Please send or update us with your username and password and we'll make sure your account goes, or continues. 60,000 people he sent this to. Half of them responded with information. Because again, they thought it was legitimate. 
What they found out is that for the Christian Mingle website, there was a particular uh, password that was really easy to hack. The other half of the people had good passwords, but the, the half of the people didn't have a great password. Can anyone tell me what the password was? Password. Close, close Five. with God. Think, 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 of, think of Christian more than... Jesus. Yeah, there you go, it was Jesus. Jesus and Jesus number one were the most common passwords. And again, it makes sense. But again, I can guess that. It's something that's easy wow. to guess. If you're able to figure out a password that easily, and again, from the Christian Mingle website, that's a no-brainer. But if you think about ways that you can actually mix up a password to make it more complex, you're going to be actually very safe online. All right, how many of you have seen this kind of thing up here? This is a pop-up ad that will appear sometimes when you're online, and um, it'll flash a couple more times. Take a look at the very upper right, this AVC, antivirus. It looks kind of legit. And then you look here, it says, warning, your computer may be at risk. And it talks about a 1-800 number, or I guess an 888 number. Um, it has things that say, the system may have found five viruses that pose a serious threat. And it lists legitimate viruses. And then it says, your personal and financial information may not be secure. All of this is accurate. It's absolutely accurate. And it's also an ad. And it's an ad that when you call that 888 number, it'll take you to Canada. And once you're in the Canada call center, they will ask for a way to access your computer and they will install this fantastic software. And that fantastic software is malware and it will slow down your system and they will say, we can speed up your system for $49.99 and they'll pay that. And then they'll have trouble accessing data. That's like, we can fix that for a scan of $299.99. And Liz and I got a call Boy, how long ago was that? For someone who is in about $1,000 um, on a system that they purchased for $300. And the poor person was so incensed that it's like, no, they're, they were a legitimate company. Look, they had this great logo. <laughs> no, they actually weren't. And here's what's kind of funny about this. So you'll see that's the logo at the top that was used. This is the legitimate United States company. It looks shockingly similar. And again, the claims that are made are deceptive. Your system may be infected, which is true. So it's correctly done advertising, but it's deceptive. It causes this concern about an immediate need and a risk, and it becomes a scam. Yes, sir? Are there any software uh, antivirus programs that you would recommend? So there are some great ones out there. And actually, ABG is one of the best ones that's out there. Um, it's a free program. Uh, there's one that is done by. Malware Mike. Yeah, well, I was gonna say that's a good. Well, I was gonna say that's a good one. The I forget the one that that advertises all the time now. It's a U.S. company, and they're actually pretty good. PCmatic. Yeah, yeah. PCmatic is good. Uh, McAfee's fine. Norton's fine. There's one that's uh, it's uh, Kapersky or Kapersky. 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 Kaspersky. Kaspersky. Yeah, Kaspersky. Don't use them. They're Russian. <laughs> and I, it's, it's that question is. There are actually some coders in there thinking that it does protect your computer, but it also sends out packets of information about your computer usage, and they think it goes back to Kapersky, which is a Russian-based company, so it actually will track your internet usage. Given all the stuff that's coming out in the news, I wonder how they get information. So does Microsoft. How do you stop Exactly. It? I was going to say, there's no way to stop Microsoft, unfortunately. Um, I use web groups. And WebGroup's another good one. I I was going to say, if you go to PC Magazine and look up what are the best companies, that's often the best way to do it. They'll give really good, honest reviews of things, uh, and I think it's worth, worth looking at. Um, so phishing attacks, that's what's really popular right now. Everyone has probably received one of these. It's typically in an email attachment, and it could be some kind of letter. Um, the ones that are, we see most often are from Chase Bank and Wells Fargo. The reason they're from Chase Bank and Wells Fargo is those are the two most popular United States banks. And so by sending this blindly to a whole bunch of people, they're hoping, oh my gosh, my Chase account is about to be closed. It's asking me for my social security number, my account number, and the name that's listed on the account, and they'll make sure my account stays open. I, they sent it to me, it must be legit. It's not. No legitimate company is gonna ask you for account information, user information, social security number and the like. But unfortunately, it looks realistic. Now, the good news with a lot of the phishing is they are from overseas, and we see a lot of grammatical errors and a lot of, of language errors in them. So sometimes they're easier to find. 
Unfortunately, now we're getting something called spear phishing. Spear phishing is actually directed to you personally because they know something about you. And you might ask the question, well, how in the world would they know anything about me? Well, again, any, everything that you do online, you can basically track. Um, I've done searches for people online that are witnesses in cases trying to find them, and I found their bridal accounts on Amazon saying, this is what I want when I get married. Because it's an open account, and I can see it. And it's crazy that I can actually find this, but I can. In the recent elections, Colorado has become a key state in national elections. And because of that, someone out there every month purchases all of the voter records of everyone in the state of Colorado and publishes it online. And it's updated every month. It is honestly, again, if I'm looking to try to find a witness that's disappeared, trying to find a home address of someone, it's actually pretty darn accurate. But it scares me that it's out there. And in fact, if you look me up, and there are over 400 Tim Johnsons in Colorado, just so you know, so it is difficult to find me. Um, but if you look and, and are actually able to find my entry, it has my name, it has my address, it has my home phone number, it has my age. It doesn't list my date of birth, but again, how many other places have I gone on where I've listed my date of birth? If someone knows my Facebook page, they'll say, hey, happy birthday, Tim, because you have a November birthday. I mean, how hard is it for someone to piece together information about me? It's not. And that's the really concerning thing is how do I protect myself online? Because I didn't ask someone to sell my voter registration ID. I didn't ask them to, to look at that, but somehow they've got it. So what can I do to kind of protect myself? Well, again, with the phishing stuff, just know when it comes in, it's unsolicited. And it's going to be something which is much more focused on you. And these, fish, uh, these spear fishers, typically know something about you. It might be that they were in your home doing some kind of service, and it was a legitimate service, but that information was uh, accessed by someone illegitimate at the company, and now that person is targeting you for some kind of phishing attack. If they know things about you, you need to make sure that you're able to kind of block that. Um, this, again, is the best story which is out there. Um, so this happened, gosh, when was it, six months ago? A little more than that. White Hat hackers out there. He goes on to the White House website. The White House website likes to brag about what happens. And there was a state dinner. And at that state dinner, Jared Kushner was there. And a lot of other people were there as well. But this White Hat hacker decided, you know what? I'm going to get the list of all the people that work at the White House and their email addresses. Why? Because it's a public record. And I'm going to set up an email account that looks a lot like Jared Kushner's email account. And I'm going to start emailing folks and trying to get information. And so he basically emailed everyone in the Trump White House saying, hey, it was great seeing you at this dinner. It was fun talking to you. I haven't spoken to you in such a long time. Can you get, you know, let me know what's the best way to reach you and I can, you know, we can hang out in the future. You know, it's a typical Jared Kushner kind of thing to say. And so he goes out and he's able to get personal information, including the official in charge of US cybersecurity who mistook the prankster for Jared Kushner disclosed his personal email address unprompted. So when he got this email, it's like, hey, don't bother me at this account. You can reach me on my personal account here. And what was really funny about how this guy got caught is he emailed Eric Trump. And of course, the press makes terrible fun of Eric Trump as not being terribly intelligent. But Eric Trump was the one that actually figured it out and called the FBI saying, I think that there's a hacker there. He was the one that caught it. And of course, you know knows why, but it, I think it's just a, it's a very funny story. Um, so switching gears to the last part of what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, kind of talk about the consequences of if you're hacked and if there's an attack. Um, so again, less than six months ago, Equifax basically came out and said, hey, we've been hacked. And there are 143 million accounts which have been compromised. Now, I have a Target red card because, again, I got four kids. And so I go to the Target just down the street here, and I shop. And Target got hacked, I don't know, three, four, five years ago. And when it got hacked, I got a letter from Target saying, hey, the card that you use with us, it got hacked. Here's a new card. We're going to offer to give you a year of, of um, uh, monitoring by some company that's going to make sure that your personal information doesn't get out there. And they had 40 million people that were affected by this. So again, a lot of people, but nothing like Equifax had. 
And so when they sent this out, I'm like, you know, that was a good way for them to do it. And the worst thing that happens is my credit card information from Target is what's at risk. And Target has took steps to, to fix that. Well, here's the problem with Equifax. Equifax doesn't give me a credit card. They're the receivers of information from all the people that I would have a loan with, where I pay my student loan, where I pay my mortgage. It has my bank account information because I opened up a bank account. It's got my credit card information, including my account numbers. And it keeps all this information. And that's what got hacked. And when we're talking about 143 million accounts, again, my kids, you know, my household of six people, four of them do not have, you know, any kind of credit because they're all under the age of 18. 143 million accounts means 143 million adults, which is well more than half of the population of the United States. And of course, what does Equifax do? Well, first off, you'll see here um, that it says in a press release today, Equifax said it discovered the unauthorized access on July 29th after it hired an outside forensic firm to investigate. You'll see when it was reported. And so the big question that you have to ask was, what the heck happened in the almost two months? Well, I'll tell you that there's an investigation going on right now because a lot of the CEOs were selling stock options before this was announced and their stock started to plummet. And so that's a huge concern is, again, it seems to be their own skins more than anything else. What a surprise. Yeah, I know. So this particular information, when it came out, you know, Equifax basically said, hey, let's send out a letter. And so anyone who was affected might have gotten a letter. And that letter says, if you send this back and sign it, we'll give you a year of free credit monitoring. And I think it was through LifeLock, but I'm not 100% certain. Whichever company it was, guess who they contract with to get information to see if your account is, is safe? Equifax. So I kind of refer to it as it's the fox guarding the hen house. And then the um, problem on top of that is the fact that while it's great that you know you get this year of free credit, when you sign that form saying, I want this, the small print says that you're signing away any other kind of legal right that you have to go after them for losing your information. It's frustrating. And again, as a consumer, it pisses me off because it's like, how can I fight such a big corporation how can I get you know, some kind of safety out of all this? Because the last thing I have time for is ordering every three or four months a copy of one of my credit reports from the three big credit reporting agencies. So we're going to talk about kind of how to protect yourself against that here coming up. Um, social engineering attacks, when you set up an online account, and people will say, OK, Tim, you sound like you were totally paranoid and you'd never do anything online. I actually do a lot online. I do online banking. I find it very safe, but I'll talk to you about how it's safe. When you sign up for an online account, oftentimes they say, OK, so get your username and your password. And now we're going to have some challenge questions for you. What was your mascot in high school? What was the first car that you owned? Uh, where did you meet your spouse or significant other? And you answer these things. I will tell you, they don't know the answers. They, it's not like testing your own knowledge. They have no idea what the actual answers are. It's to help you if you forget your password. Well, here's the problem. Again, I have got four young kids. There are a lot of families out there where your kids are grown up and they might have a, an addiction to an opio op opioid or they might be down on their luck or they might owe money and they don't know what to do and they don't know how to approach you. But they know your mascot of your high school and they know where you met your spouse and they know the first car that you got because it's still in the garage and they can hack your account and take things that belong to you and so it's really important to kind of avoid this social engineering which is out there and again if you have people who come into your home to clean if you have people who come in to help out in the home and you have pictures of family members or you have your favorite things out there they can learn things about you, and they can try to access your information. So again, when they ask, where did you meet your spouse? Well, my answer is purple. And when they ask, you know, what's the first car that you owned? Well, that's purple, too. I don't really care what the answer is. It's a word that I'm going to remember that no one else is going to be able to guess because they're not in my head. So think of that thing, whether it's chandelier, whether it's dishwashing liquid, Whatever it is, that's the answer to everything. So if you do forget your password, you know dishwashing liquid 
is the key to everything, and that allows me to get into my accounts. It's silly, but it's a way to protect yourself. Um, and again, never share your passwords. I will tell you right now, that's the big thing I'm trying to teach my kids. My kids love to watch Netflix. And some parents, shockingly, don't let their kids have Netflix. And they'll ask my kids, hey, can I get the password? And again, we've locked ours down, so like, all they can see is kids stuff. But it's really scary to me that this idea of sharing passwords. And if they share your Apple ID or your Google ID and they get into your system, it's a huge problem. Um, we had a family um, at one of the schools I did a training at when we talked about internet safety for kids where they gave out their Apple ID and the kid was playing some game that had buy-ins where you could say for 99 cents I'm gonna buy this gem package and for $1.99 I'm gonna buy this special hero. And $500 later, these parents caught on going, where are all these purchases coming from? And what they had done is they had tied their credit card to this Apple ID, and when their child shared their Apple ID, it really was a problem. So never do that. Um, two-step verification, how many use this? Great, use two-step verification when you're online. Okay, and it looks like at least half of you do. Two-step verification is what it used to be when we go to the bank and we had an ATM card. The whole idea about two-step verification is you have something in your head and you have something in your hand. Because again, if I go up to an ATM and I just start randomly punching in numbers, it's not going to give me any money. You know, even if I know your PIN number and I start having, you know, putting it in there, unless I have your card, it's not going to give me any money. So the whole idea about two-step verification is the same. If I am your you know, deadbeat child and I have a drug problem and I know what your password is and your username, I can log in and I can take money from you. But if you require two-step verification, I won't be able to do that. And the way two-step verification works is you go online, you enter your username and your password, and then what'll happen is, is the bank or whatever other organization sends a message to your cell phone. And if you don't have a cell phone, it'll do it to your home phone. It's actually kind of a nice little feature. And if you don't have the ability to you know, get a, a, a call, a banker sometimes will actually call you at home. And that's the newest thing that Chase is offering is they actually have a banker who calls you and says, your code is. It's great. So what ends up happening is you get this text and you enter that code from your phone and voila, you get to your account. But without having that cell phone, something in your hand, no one can get into your own personal information. It is a pain. It really is at times. And what I hate is when I do it and I don't get the page or I don't get the text, I have to do it again or do it again. And it's, it slows things down. But when it comes to your financial security, you absolutely need to do it. Um, be proactive again with your passwords. Right now the recommendation is, again, use lots of numbers and letters. I will tell you what I end up using is I use a password manager program. I pay $19 a year. Um, there's about 15 of these programs. There's a few of them listed here at the bottom. But again, if you go to the PC Magazine website and talk about password managers, they're all really good. They're all encrypted. So again, if you're putting in passwords, you, you're not gonna have someone out on the internet you know, getting this information and being able to decode your stuff. It allows you to have different passwords for each account. So again, if Wells Fargo gets broken into, it, you know, and they get my password and my username, well, it's not going to affect my Chase account. It's not going to affect my you know, first bank account. It, 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 they don't translate. And so I really minimize my losses there. Wait, so, so how yeah. does that work? It's like, so you, you go on to your Wells Fargo account, mm -hmm. and your login ID and, and password, but, but your password manager is encrypting that? Right. So what will end up happening is the way, the, so the way it ends up working, and it's oftentimes on your phone, and that's the, the big concern is that if I'm on my phone and I enter the information and I send it, if I do it through a password manager, the password manager encrypts the information from my phone to the endpoint, which is the router that it's going to. Once it hits the router, it's on its own. But when it's passing through that airspace, yeah. it has an encryption code to it. So you never see it no. working? No, you never see it actually working. But because Norton will pop up Right, and you can, and it's not a bad program. It's just take a look at the options that they have and the features that they have. Okay. 
some of these password managers, like the one I have, and it's shocking the number of passwords that you actually have online. Because again, I have a New York Times account. I have you know my bank accounts. I've got an account that you know goes into you know X, Y, and Z. And when you count it up, I have over 200 different accounts that I could have had passwords to. I got a thousand. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, right. Well, and then the concern is, is I get, yeah, I have this junk, you know, email account that, you know, if I'm going to buy something, I put it into my junk account. Well, if my junk account gets hacked, I don't want, you know, that password and username to be used everywhere else. So that's going to have a different password and username than all my other accounts are. But I'm going to forget what it is. And so having that password manager is really helpful. So I, I have a thousand. I only know two of them. Yeah. The rest are random 12 characters. And that's what's great is, yeah, you can do these random 12 character things. It's really a fantastic way to do it. Oh, I see. So, so the password manager will actually Last pass is a vault. That mm -hmm. crazy it's a vault that you log in. You know, one password to get in and unlocks all your passwords. Right. Oh. But yeah, you can make it different. Yes. Right, and so yeah, the, the the biomarker stuff that is fantastic information, and so and now the new one is face recognition. So that's where a lot of these phones are going right now, and and the devices it'll actually do your face. Um, what's interesting, and I haven't had a chance to test it yet because honestly, I'm too cheap to buy the phones that do the face recognition. Is if I had a picture of me and I held it in front, will it recognize me, or won't it recognize me? I don't know. I'm sure they've figured out a way to avoid that. I would hope. Um, but it's one of the things that I want to kind of test and see what's and going I on. Some of the uh, some banks or brokerage firms they are doing voice recognition. Yes, and the voice and again the software is and the technology is there. I always wonder, okay, if I'm sick, <coughs> am I not going to be able to get into my account? Or you know, if something changes about me, am I not going to be able to get into my account? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but yeah, they're they're trying a lot of different things to try to increase. Yeah. That kind of safety and with that's folks. The case, apparently, the, the, the company you're trying to access will call you. Right. To see, to is it really you? Yeah. yeah. And again, it's a it's a, another way to do that two factor or two step verification. And it's a and if they offer it, I take them up on it because the nice thing is is if I sign up for that two step verification, and they mess up mm -hmm. by not sending me the code or having someone call and not doing the right thing. Well, guess what? It's on them at that point, and actually, my liability goes down, and they might actually owe me or have to refund me the information. Yeah. I thought um, I do two step verification because that's like if they, you know, if I haven't logged into something for a while, mm -hmm. and um, you know, like we don't recognize your computer, and you know, enter your email, we'll send you a, 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 a and, and then you know, it sends me the, the code or whatever, and then I log in. Right. And the reason it does that is after about 30 days, your IP address on your computer changes. And so it doesn't recognize it. And that's why you have to re-authenticate it each time. Oh. Um, so it's actually a, it's a good thing that it's doing. It's not you know doing it for weird reasons, or is that someone tried to get into your system. Yeah, yeah. It actually yeah. does that naturally because of the way IP addresses are used here in the United States. Okay. Yeah, it's not a big deal if you log in all the time. Last couple things I'll talk about again, using disposable emails. So if you want to sign up for a coupon, if you want to sign up for a free offer, you're like, hey, they're giving away a cruise. Um, right now, the big thing, you can go online and you can get the Hamilton tickets mm -hmm. that are all sold out. Sometimes they require an email address. Again, I'm not sure whoever, what they're going to do with that email address. Think about getting a junk email. And again, I've got oh, 80, 90,000 emails in that account because I never use it. I don't want to look at all the crud that's sent there. But if I'm signing up and I need to get that email address there, I'm going to use one of those junk emails and just go in and search for the, the right thing. I have not won tickets yet, but I heard it is actually possible to do. Um, and then be careful about fake applications. Um, right now on the, the Google Store and the Apple Store, combined, there are 8 million applications you can buy. There is no way law enforcement can check these to say, is this legitimate or is this not legitimate? There's a lot of them out there. For example, if I go and I say, I want to get the Target app, well, there's like six Target apps. Which one is the right one? 
Well, that's the problem is they might not be the right one. And if you purchase, and oftentimes they're free, one of these applications that turns out to be a third party user, and it's a third party user that installs malware or some kind of uh, monitoring software on your phone, you've kind of invited it in. So if you go online to say, okay, I want to get the Target app because I want to get the cartwheel to buy cheap stuff you know, when I have to go there, by all means do it. Go to the Target website and see what the symbol is for their application or you can download it from there directly fr onto your phone. Don't necessarily go to the store and hope that it's the right one because again, Google, uh, the Google Play as well as the, the, the Apple Store they don't verify a lot of these. You can upload a, an application as long as it meets certain criteria because again, they don't have the staffing to check every single application that's up there as well. It is really, you know, again, the wide open sea when it comes to those kinds of applications. Um, so again, your initial response to fraud, we want you to make a report. Even though you might think, no one, you know, it's not, nothing's gonna happen. That's true in some cases, but it's also true that they can take steps and they can try to shut a lot of these stuff, uh, a lot of these places down. So again, the FTC um, has a website. Um, so it's the Federal Trade Commission and it's the Complaint Assistant. It is a legitimate website. Um, you can go there and again, report this, and this is often good for the folks that are out of state, things that you have coming in that you're thinking is from out of state. Contact the police, file a report. Sheriff's office here, they will take reports. Sometimes they'll say, there's nothing we can do, which might be very true, but the idea is that you wanna make that police report because when you noticed it on July 1st and you made the report on July 2nd and it happened on June 30th, when your bank says, I'm sorry, you didn't make a police report in the required 30 days, well, guess what? You've got a police report to prove that you did and that, again, might force them to refund your money because of something they did. So it's taking those necessary steps. Even if you're thinking, gosh, there's no way this is ever gonna be solved, that's okay, make the report. Yeah. Two questions. So, uh -huh. if, uh, so if, you're, if your credit card is used you, and you find a fraudulent charge on it, call the police? Well, call your credit card company first. Yeah. Because oftentimes your credit card company goes, we're reversing it right now. Okay. You know, every so often you'll get in the mail, like you know, you'll have a Discover card and suddenly you'll get a new one. It's like, okay, this one doesn't expire. My, my current one doesn't expire for another two years. Why am I getting a new one? And then you look, it's like, it's got a different number. That's the stuff they do internally. And actually, I had a Discover card, and suddenly I started getting all of these charges. And again, funny story, they're from porn sites. And my wife is like, this is an account we don't use, and all these charges are for all these porn sites. And I'm like, uh-huh. So I call up, and sure enough, the number that was being used is a really old number that you know, had been deactivated a long time ago, and they were able to go online and make all these purchases. They quickly reversed them. Wow. Nothing that I even bothered to call the police about because it was really a credit card issue. Um, there's no way anything was gonna happen since they reversed it. There was no reason for me to make a police report because I wasn't out any money. The concern is, is they say, well, did you make the purchase? No. And it's like, well, it, it says that you did. It says they swiped the card doesn't mean that I made the purchase. It means that a card was swiped that had my information on it that could have been, you know, gotten at the gas station down the road. Yeah, they just made the card. Exactly. So, random or an old. Exactly. So, call the credit card company first if on a credit card issue, and if they decide we're not reversing stuff, make a police report. Because the nice thing about the police report is it'll help you in the future when it comes to trying to put a fraud note on your account mm -hmm. or when you try to lock down your account, put a freeze on it. Um, which is kind of what we're getting to here. So again, your initial fraud alert that you can put on your own credit history, and again, you gotta get it from all three agencies. If you put a fraud alert on there, it lasts for 90 days, and you're able to get these credit reports to see, is someone trying to open up a line of credit in my name? If you are a victim of very serious identity theft, you can get an extended fraud alert. That can last for up to seven years. What's required? That's right, you need a copy of an identity theft report, so you gotta make that police report. And again, it entitles you to two free credit reports from all three agencies each year. So it doubles what you can get right now. Um, again, it's a helpful way for you to protect yourself. But you might be out there going, okay, <laughs> I don't have time to do this, and I completely understand that kind of response. And so the question is, is what, what can I do? The great thing is all three credit reporting agencies allow you to either put a freeze or a hold on your credit. Now, 
the difference between a freeze and a hold might be confusing. Always remember, if you get a freeze, that that's cool, because that's what you want to do. So I'll tell you what a freeze does, and I actually recommend this to a lot of folks who are not accessing new credit. So again, if you're at a point in your life where you're like, I'm not gonna go out and need a new car, I'm not going to the furniture store you know, over the Memorial Day weekend and buy a new furniture, I don't need to get a new HELOC or anything else like that, I just, I'm not using my credit right now. Well, if that's the case, freeze it. Because when you freeze it, you can't open up new lines of credit. Your current credit card you can use, and your current HELOC you can use, and all the stuff that you have out there you can pay and use at will. You just can't get anything new. And for a lot of people, that's that nice peace of mind saying, well, listen, no one's going to be able to open up a credit card in my name. No one's going to be able to go out and try to buy a car in my name or a HELOC or anything else against my house. And it protects me, and I don't need to order these reports every four months and look to see if something's happened. Now again, if you're at a point in your life where you're like, I am accessing too much credit and new credit, I can't do it, then don't do it. But the nice thing about this, again, to put it in, so again, for the adding it in, it's free. You need to tell all three credit reporting agencies, I want to put a freeze on my credit. And they give you a PIN code. Don't lose the PIN code, because it's really hard to unlock your credit then. If you then decide a year later, oh, you know, I need to get a new car. I need to lift it. It'll cost you 10 bucks for a lift, not to remove it. If you remove it, it has to stay removed for a year. I'm just going to lift it because I need to get that new car because mine broke down unexpectedly. It's going to cost me 30 bucks to do it. You might say, God, I don't want to spend 30 bucks because why don't I just keep my credit open? Well, think of all of those credit reporting agencies that are out there saying, we will guard your identity for $19.99 a month. Or you can update to, you know, upgrade it to $29.95 a month. Well, again, that's $360 a year. Why did you say 30? Oh, because each, each, each of the three credit reporting agencies will cost you 10 bucks. So that's why it's 30. Sorry, it's a good question. Um, it's a lot cheaper to do that. So again, if I'm not accessing credit, no one else needs to access my credit either. Yes, sir. I look at, I've done this, and I look at it as a two-factor Exactly. And it, again, it, you can still get those free credit reports every year from folks, but you really don't need to. It's kind of a nice way to lock down you, you know, something that's really important to you, which is your credit history. Yeah. What do you, what, okay, what do you freeze your credit and do it just for a job? Because I know mm -hmm. you check your credit. Is that an issue? Or it can be. Sometimes, well, again, if you're trying to get insurance, if you're trying to get a new job, if you're applying to live at a place, sometimes they'll run a credit history of you. Again, running a credit history is not applying for credit. Okay. So if they run a credit history, it shouldn't be a problem. And if it is, and I really want a place to live, I might spend the 30 bucks to, to do it. But you're not applying for credit, you're just having a credit check okay. done against you. So it should be okay. Is that the best place to go to? So this is just one of the places. So that's the TransUnion, but you'll have to go to Experian and you'll also have to go to Equifax. So all three credit reporting agencies, and we have a handout that tells you how to do it. So, and, and hopefully folks have picked these up, and if not, we can do it at the very end, too. I thought that Equifax, um, that con, uh, a federal government agency was leaning on Equifax to make lifting and then, and then reinstituting free. And that's, whoops, that's what they're trying to do, especially if you're a victim of identity theft, it oh. is free. But because of their breach, they're trying to force them to do it as well. And then what constitutes victim of ID? When are you a victim of ID? If you've reported that you're a victim of identity theft and you have that police report in your hand saying, someone used my credit card, I made a report of it, you get to be in this well, can, category. Can a person, um, and I, I'm sure this is probably illegal, but can you? <laughs> you can don't make you a false file, report. A, a police report that says, I was a victim of ID theft. I mean, does yeah. there have to be, I mean, I can't see a, a, a Boulder County Sheriff's deputy coming out and being an expert on ID theft and just, will they just take my word for it or do you need to show them? You'll need to show them something that, you, like like the, a copy of your credit, your, your credit card, you know, statement that shows all these, you know, charges being made that you didn't make. They'll ask to, to do that. 
Okay. So, so but does that constitute ID theft? If someone is using your credit card without your authorization? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, that's ID theft. Well, who hasn't had that? Right. Right. <laughs> right. But again, it's got to be something recent and that you're making a report for. So, yeah. So this is the reason why I'm here. I recently, just Tuesday, last Tuesday, um, someone tried to pretend to be my husband, called the bank, tried to get money, tried to get our money. Mm -hmm. And so the bank's working with us. We closed the account. Good. We changed our credit cards. But, um, but how, how does that, I mean, should I be? Placing a, a police report on that and going through all this? Yes. Okay. It, it protects you. And, and again, the bank's working on it, and they're probably doing a great job with it, but you should also make a police report because you can then go in and say, I need to have a fraud alert on my credit report, and I need to make sure I have a freeze in place, and it's free for me to lift it and unlift it. And is it your office that I call to talk through this? So make the police report initially. Yeah. If you need help walking through what the heck do I do next, that's all of our info. Because this will take longer and people don't have to, although, although it happens, and you have to be more, you know. Yeah, okay. it happens every day. It just bothers me that Equifax is one of the three that you have to report to and they were hacked. Yeah, I know. And we have to give them money. I know. To it, 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 this whole thing is bothering Well, and again, if you're the victim of identity theft, you don't need to give them a dime. Okay. Yeah, but but you need to have that police report. I know, I know. It's frustrating. It's really frustrating. And again, it's right now, it's, the, it's the, the landscape of what we're having to deal with and the rule set that we have to deal with. Yeah. We're just trying to give you the best advice to get through the maze that they've created to protect you. And so I have, I have at least a couple weeks to be able to get all this done, contact you guys, make sure I'm doing, mm -hmm. yep. getting everything right. Yeah, and we'd love to help out. I mean, okay. it's just make that police report first so you have that in hand. Okay. So when you go to TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, you can say, this is the police report and the police report number. I'm a victim of identity theft. Help me. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is us. We're the Community Protection Division. Liz Parker and I do a lot of the work here. Uh, I'll let Liz chime in. She's been great listening this whole time. Um, but again, we love to have visitors. If you're in the Boulder area and you come to the DA's office, we have volunteers. Myself and Liz will sit and talk with you about any issue that you might have. If you have friends who live in Boulder County, who are like, I'm not going tonight, but tell me what they say because I might do something, tell them. You know, we're happy to help. Again, we're not trying to drum up business. We're busy just fine. We want to make sure we're helping people in the community. You can call us. Again, that's the main number. Just call and ask for our Community Protection Division online, uh, bouldercounty.org. If you go to the district attorney's website and from there, our Community Protection Program, we're hopefully going to be revamping our website here pretty soon to have more information. But we want to give as much information as we can to you to kind of help you. Um, but we'll open it up if you have any questions. Yeah. First, thank you very much for being here. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Good. One of your very early slides, you mentioned the Craigslist. Yes. Do you consider Craigslist a safe place to sell mm -hmm. items? It's the Wild West. you got to be careful because, again, I'm selling, uh, you know, this piece of furniture and come out to my house and you can pick it up. Well, if I'm saying come out to my house and pick it up and there's a burglar out there who says, hey, I know this guy's moving because he says moving soon, trying to get rid of furniture, someone breaks into my house, I mean, you've just advertised that on Craigslist, unfortunately. So, and then we do on occasion have people who show up and are robbed you know, if you go out to buy something, you know, it's like, let's meet at this location and you can buy this item. They show up going, give me the money, and they don't have an item. That happens. So you just have to be very, whoops, you have to be very cautious when you use these kinds of things. Figure out a safe location. If you're worried about an exchange, you know, go to the, 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 the go to the sheriff's office out here. And Do I, the exchange there. Go ahead. And I will say probably over the past two weeks, the majority of calls we've gotten are about Craigslist scams. Yeah. Landlord, tenant is advertised, they'll pick up a legitimate real estate company's website listing for uh, <coughs> house for rent in the county, and um, you, you, they will fraudulently advertise that as theirs. You call the number, they want a deposit over on a credit card over the, or a, even worse, some kind of wire transfer. Um, I, that has pro I've probably gotten five calls on that just this week alone. It's now time for CU students to begin to look for fall housing. So now we see an uptick in that kind of scam 
different kind of scam. Also on Craigslist is a handyman who Tim and I have been talking about quite a bit this week, who seems to um, say that he can repair just about anything. And um, you pay, he comes over, he'll take a look at the uh, appliance that's not working. He'll perhaps rip a part out of it or two. You'll pay him 250 bucks and you never see him again or your part. And we can do, we're doing some. We have to flag those ads every single time that we hear about them. We search them by his phone number, this particular individual, and we flag every single one. We can notify Craigslist via email. We're not really sure where that goes, <laughs> whether a person is actually at the other end of that. But now that it has happened several times, because we have received calls from people in the community about this same individual, we're able to take it, or I, Tim, able to take it to Tim and say, "Look, there's a bad actor out here, and we have to do something about it." So that is the function of, as well, of our office. Um, Actually, it's search warrants right now, so it's it's more we see a pattern, and so we know it's criminal actions, mm -hmm. and it's something which um, mm -hmm. face or that uh, Craigslist will keep records of, and so we'll get IP addresses sometimes, oh. and so hopefully we'll be able to get a location of this person and actually identify him and be able to arrest him. Yeah. 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 Um, my credit card's been hacked four times mm -hmm. in the past four months. So, and, and the bank has been, you know, they'll reverse it and everything. Mm -hmm. But should I make a police report? I mean, it's all been for like 50 cents in a Michigan, you know, funky things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah. And that's what's going on. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So again, as long as your bank is servicing and as long as you're not having issues with them, you're okay. okay. It's just when they suddenly say, nope, you know, this is you, we know it's you, and you're like, oh, no, I was not in Michigan, yeah. that's something where you're going to need to make a police report. But what I would also do is hang on to all of those, you know, the letters that you said, this has been reversed, because you, you'll always get a letter that says, the charge for 50 cents has been reversed. Hang on to those. Okay. Um, you know, I, I have a red folder at home where I put all of the you know, the alerts that I get if something is amiss, mm -hmm. so I know I can go back to it and look at it later. I'm thinking about scanning it at some point, but I haven't gotten around to doing it yet. So, other questions or anything? Again, if you have questions after tonight, you know how to reach us. And even if something is just yeah. suspicious, yeah. suspicious, give us a call. Email, you can send to us without opening it. Don't open the attachment, you can forward it to us. Right. And we will take a look. Actually, and we will it, you don't have to wait until something's happened. In other words, if there's something suspicious, we want to take a look at that. Too. And, and it is our job to, you know to follow that up. Oh, sorry. Go you know ahead. What I do when I get, um, I get a suspicious Thank you. I, I put my mouse over the, uh, the link, and if it looks like something weird, it's like, bye bye, you're going to my trash. Right. <laughs> Good. Good. All right. Well, yes. thank you guys for coming out tonight. We know we went a little long, but please let us know if there's anything else we can do. Good. Good. You bet.